And there's a lot of talk and a lot of conversation about a constitutional convention, an amendment convention, and those kind of issues. And I basically want to tell you where I am and explain why. And I'll be glad to answer questions. But let me begin with an apology. Uh, because I have to be in Fayetteville at 3.30, and I was timing, when I came through Fayetteville, I was looking to see exactly how much time I've got, and I've, I've got 35 minutes, so help me to walk out of here at 2.55, because, and I need you to help me, because I'll forget the time, oh, I know. and so help me do that. Yeah, and, you don't have your timekeeper here, yeah. So, yeah, so I need some, I don't have my, I don't have my timer here, so <laughs> forgive me, but I, I told, uh, I think I told Kay and Sherry a moment ago that I'm no longer in charge of my schedule. In fact, the only part of my life that I now control begins now when I get up to start talking. And so I take full uh, 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 liability, <laughs> full responsibility for everything I say. But to thank you for letting me come. And I just want to give you a little bit, a little history here and let you kind of understand why I am where I am on this issue. And I'll be glad to try to answer questions if I can. I, we do a lot of Q and A's. Well, we do a lot of Q's, not always a lot of A's, because <clears throat> I don't always have answers for everything. But just a little bit of a history and that will help you help sprain where I am. And let me tell you, I know there are a lot of agendas uh, out there now. And let me tell you what my agendas are. One is I'm a passionate student and defender of the Constitution. Secondly, I am a passionate defender and advocate of uh, uh, the state's rights, that we've got to recover the intended balance of power between the federal government and the states and that I'm also a passionate defender of the Constitutional Republic that our founders gave us when they gifted us the country that we now enjoy. So those are my simple agendas, uh, at least in the context of what I want to talk about today. But a little bit of historical, a little bit of historical setting here in context, and it's important to do this study in historical context. But when those 55 men gathered in the old Pennsylvania State House back in 1787, they were under an immense amount of duress, and not just from the fact that the summer of 1787 was the worst heat wave on record in Philadelphia when they met in the old Pennsylvania State House. But the new nation that they had created was only about 10 years old, and it was actually starting to fall apart. Uh, and you know that it was uh, uh, in the very beginning when the, the nation was created, it was created under the Articles of Confederation. And the Articles of Confederation, um, basically loosely knit together 13 sovereign states. And by the way, I do believe in the sovereignty of the state. But it, it loosely knit together 13 sovereign states. But under the Confederation, these states were so independent that basically they had created all, almost something like 13 independent countries. In fact, it had gotten so bad that uh, some of these states were actually printing their own currency. Uh, they had... Um, uh, they had created such horrible import and export tariffs that trade between the states has fallen apart. And in fact, uh, the little island, the, the little state of Rhode Island uh, was financing the, the entire cost of its state government just on import and export tariffs coming in and out of the state of Rhode Island. In fact, uh, the elitist of that time, and we've always had the elitist among us, but the elitist of that time called uh, uh, Rhode Island the Rogue Island because it was controlled by the debtor class. In fact, they, they had just passed, in 1786, they had just passed a law um, for giving all debts. And they were considering a measure uh, for redistributing all property to its original owners every 13 years. So, I mean, they, it was really, uh, an, uh, well, it was a disaster, and to say the least. In fact, it had all gotten so bad that Benjamin Franklin uh, when he was uh, writing about a possible constitutional convention in 1787, wrote that if we don't fix the problems facing our nation, that, uh, that the, uh, our nation is going to fall apart, and as the word I think he used were irrevocably unraveled, or something to that, something to that extent that Franklin wrote. So, in 1787, the Constitutional Congress, that is the Congress under the Confederation, passed the following resolution. They said, resolved that in the opinion of Congress, it is expedient that on the second Monday in May next, the convention of delegates who shall have been appointed by the several states be held at Philadelphia for the sole and express purpose of revising the Articles of Confederation 
and reporting to Congress and the several, legisl several legislatures such alterations and provisions therein as shall when agreed to in Congress and confirmed by the states render the federal constitution adequate for the exigencies of government and the preservation of the Union. So that was the, that was the uh, uh, re resolution issued by the Confederation Congress. The problem was, was that the Confederation Congress had no authority to compel such a convention, and the, indicated by the fact that it was simply a passed a resolution. It was not a statute or, or a, any kind of a law. It was a resolution. But they had no authority to compel such a convention, and the states fundamentally ignored it. Uh, the the uh, Congress has called for a convention. We had a convention because James Madison was persuaded that uh, the country was going to fail if we didn't do something to fix the problems that it faced, and uh, he convinced a reluctant and retired George Washington to uh, uh, participate in the convention, and when he got George Washington to, to agree, which took him, as I recall, six to nine months, um, and then he issued the call again to the delegate to the states to form this convention or meet at this convention and promised that George Washington would be there to preside. Then the states began to respond. And some of the other problems that were being faced at this time was the fact that um, the, the, under the Articles of Confederation, the nation had no national defense. In fact, when it put its ships on the high seas for international trade or passage, they were customarily pirated without protection and without consequence. They had no national defense. Secondly, the nation of Spain had blockaded the Mississippi River, and none of the states could, to the, could ply commodities up and down the Mississippi River, and there was no defense uh, because there, were no, there was no national defense uh, uh, um, correlated between the states. So these were some of the problems that they were facing. Now, when the founders um, founded the nation, when they first formed this, uh, this, this government that we call the United States of America, and especially when they drafted the Constitution of 1787 in Philadelphia, they were familiar with two different kinds of conventions. One of them is called a plenary convention. You're familiar with the word plenary. The word plenary fundamentally means unlimited. And it can mean unlimited scope or unlimited power, and sometimes it means both. So they were familiar with plenary conventions. They were also very familiar with limited scope conventions, which is the opposite of a plenary convention. In fact, almost all the conventions that the founders attended during this period between 1776 and 1787, and subsequent to that, were actually limited scope conventions. A plenary, a plenary convention was very unusual. So... The states of, um, of New York and Massachusetts, uh, well, let me tell you first that Rhode Island, not to your surprise, so elected not to participate. <laughs> well, they were worried about what they were doing. It was going to get clipped in the wings, and it did. But uh, the states of Massachusetts and New York issued commissions to their delegates to participate in a limited scope convention. But the, the other 10 states issued uh, commissions to their delegates to participate in a plenary convention. In other words, a convention that did not have scope. And let me just read a couple of those commission statements to you that are representative of the 10 states. Here's Pennsylvania. They commissioned their delegates to meet such deputies as may be appointed and authorized by the other states to assemble in the said convention at the city aforesaid and to join with them in devising, deliberating on, and discussing all such alterations and further provisions as may be necessary to render, render the federal constitution fully adequate to the exigencies of the Union. South Carolina was similar. Devising and discussing all such alterations, clauses, articles, and provisions, as may be thought necessary to render the federal constitution entirely adequate to the actual situation and future good government of the United States. Uh, Virginia's was almost exactly uh, identical. Basically, what they commissioned their delegates to do, these 10 states commissioned their delegates to do, was to do whatever had to be done, to do what was necessary to meet the, the, the emergencies facing the nation at that time. That's called a plenary commission. And, but Massachusetts and New York issued uh, limited scope commissions to their delegates and said, all you can do 
is revise the Articles of Confederation. You're limited to that. So when the discussion began and moved beyond more than simply uh, revising the Articles of Confederation, the delegates from New York went home, all except Alexander, Alexander Hamilton, who hung around and asked permission to sign the Constitution, although uh, he was not representing his state when he did that. The delegates from Massachusetts, three of them, uh, there were three delegates from Massachusetts, two of them stayed, but didn't sign the Constitution. One of them went home and obviously did not sign the Constitution either. But uh, those delegates from Massachusetts and New York did not participate, therefore, in the, in the uh, convention's adoption of the Constitution of 1787 because their commissions did not permit it. So the founders, when they crafted the Constitution, uh, did not believe they had created an infallible document. In fact, they were sure they had not created an infallible document, and they believed that there were possibilities that the docu document might be amended, especially those who were so adamantly anti-slavery, even expressed hope that it would be amended at some point in the future, and they hoped as soon as 20 years after its adoption. So they devised two possible methods uh, or they developed two possible methods for what they call corrections of necessity, amendments to the Constitution. It's Article 5, and let me read that to you. The Congress, whenever two-thirds of both houses shall deem it necessary, shall propose amendments to this Constitution, or on the application of the legislatures of two-thirds of the several states, shall call a convention for proposing amendments, which in either case shall be valid to all intents and purposes as part of this Constitution, when ratified by the legislatures of three-fourths of the several states, or conventions in three-fourths thereof, as the one or the other mode of the ratification may be proposed by the Congress. So here's the first method, and that is two-thirds, and listen to this part, two-thirds, but not necessarily 290. How many, how many members of the House of Representatives are there? 538. Okay, then you got both houses now, just yeah. the House of Representatives. 435. 435. Two-thirds is 290. So the, the, the process says uh, two-thirds of the members of the House of Representatives, that, that would be 290, but I'll show you in a moment that it doesn't require 290 uh, of, the, of the entire House. And then two-thirds of the Senate, the Constitution says, must agree on the same text of the proposed amendment. Two-thirds of the Senate would be 67. There are 100 senators. However, in the, the national prohibition cases of 1920, the Supreme Court held that two-thirds of both houses, that requirement was a requirement of a present quorum. So how many members of the House or the Senate does it require to have a quorum, do you know? In this case, it's a simple majority. So 50% of the House is a quorum, or 51% of the House is a quorum, and 51% uh, of the Senate is a quorum. So basically, the interpretation of the Supreme Court was that it only takes two-thirds of 51 percent of the House and two-thirds of 51 percent of the Senate to, to agree on the text of a constitutional amendment or to be sent to the states for ratification. Um, but the founders also foresaw the possibility that Congress might be indisposed or incapable or even impotent or impotent, excuse me, to... <laughs> to uh, um, uh, solve an emergency facing the nation. So they made a second process for amending the Constitution. It says the Congress, uh, on the application of the legislature of two-thirds of the several states, shall call a convention for proposing amendments. Now, it is important to understand that this clause calls for what's called a limited scope uh, convention. There is no provision in the Constitution for a plen 